Hello, Redemption Church, believers and visitors from around the world. My name is Ridwan, and I was saved and born again here in this very house of Redemption Church over six years ago, and my life has never been the same again, and it's all because of one name, Jesus. Now, before I get started, I just want to thank and honor our wonderful pastors, Josh and Tara, for this opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Thank you, pastors. I know this is only the beginning for what God has in store for redemption. So, friends, God, by His grace, has given us a peace, a peace for any situation or any circumstance, a too-good-to-be-true peace. Why is it too good to be true? Well, if you are on the receiving end of a sin, of a situation, of a circumstance outside of your control, or perhaps you are the one who created that situation, created that circumstance, that sin, whether you're on the side of the innocent and the brokenhearted, or you're on the side of the guilty and the condemnation, the word of the Lord says that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, much, much more. Romans 5.20. So the deeper, the darker, the more hopeless your situation is, the more redemption there is for you. You see, friends, my life came to a situation and a circumstance where I was on both sides of that picture. A lot of things, a lot of sin, a lot of chaos in my life. Responsible person, me. And the other Lots of things in my life out of my control, and I needed redemption. And as we, we hear the word of the Lord today, I hope that this becomes a message for you, a testimony for you that will change your life. You see, I was looking for something in my life that would be able to make sense of this mess that I had in front of me, make sense of it, and I was searching for this missing piece. I knew there was a missing piece. You know, like when you have a, a, a puzzle and you've got all of those missing pieces placed in, in, in the right place and it's making a picture, it's starting to make a picture, but there's something in the middle that is missing. And the more you look at it, the picture just says, I'm incomplete, I'm missing. Or perhaps it's a series of notes like dum tum. And without that final note, the previous notes make no sense. In fact, the longer we go without hearing that final note, the more stressful the air, the atmosphere is. I was looking for that missing piece and I looked for it in lots of different places in the world, in a job, in money, in possessions. It's not there. I looked for it in things that you would consider as good things to seek like improving yourself, self-help, being able to do a thing really, really well. It's not there. Relationships, it's not there. People will let you down. Unclean things, I don't know why we seek it for missing pieces in our lives and unclean things. There's no peace in that. Religion, praying five times a day, pleading with God to make my life right. Meditation, being one with thyself, emptying thyself. All of these things just point to one thing that you cannot save yourself. If I'm a ball or an egg and I'm dropping down to the floor, splat, I cannot save myself while I'm busy going down. Something has to grab and snatch me up. You see that peace, that peace that gives inner peace for our soul, for our bodies, that radiates through our bodies, for our minds is not of this world. It's not of this world. That peace, you see, is from another world, another realm. That peace had to enter the realm from the realm of eternal into this world and be left as a finished work. You see, that peace is a person and his name is Jesus. And to know him, to know him, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, is to know peace. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you. 
peace I leave with you. You know, someone can leave something here, but it's not for me. It could be left with me, but it's not really for me. But he says, peace I give, my peace I give to you. You don't have to earn it. When someone gives you something, all you need to do is possess it. Now you may think, oh, what's the catch, right? What's the catch, read one? Well, this world we know all too well, they'll come with something that's even free, but they will come with an angle. T's and C's apply. Like Facebook, great platform, can connect with your friends and your family, but because it has your profile, it has your likes, it knows what you, what you like, it sells that to advertisers. And so you think it's free, but actually you are the product. But Jesus here says, not as the world gives, do I give. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. This is the kind of peace for a troubled heart. This is the kind of peace that casts out all fear. And I want to share with you my journey to know this peace, to know my Jesus, my Messiah. And I hope that it's a word in season for you and that you will be blessed by it. You see, my journey to Jesus Christ started when I was just a young boy, nine years old. And in many ways, you know, I'm still that nine-year-old boy. I was a quiet little boy. Uh, you see, always wanting to listen and observe than to speak. We call ourselves introverts. But here I am, unashamed and unafraid to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there I was, nine years old, kind of observing this world, the little world that I was exposed to. And I saw a world in pain, a world spiraling into decay. And here, growing up in apartheid South Africa, you get to see inequality. And I'm not sure where you're from, but I'm sure when you were young, you, get, you got to see inequality. And I saw suffering, and I saw just how brutal this world can be, and I saw how a child can become like their parents, sometimes a little bit more wiser, but almost always a little bit more hurt by the world. And out of a reaction, out of a reaction, they hurt the world around them. And so the downward spiral continues. And I heard from my parents and my grandparents how the world was so much better in their days. And I, as, as they said that, I always saw that hint of worry in their eye for the future and its uncertainty. And so you may think, well, Ridwan, these should not be the thoughts of a young boy. And perhaps you're right, but let's not kid ourselves. At a very young age, children know what the deal is about life. We don't give them enough credit for what they perceive and what they observe. I've seen it in my young boy. Of course, he's now a young man but they perceive, be aware of that. And so one night, it was quiet. I was laying in my little bed. Everyone was asleep and I could hear my younger brother breathing peacefully as he slept. And feeling so blessed, feeling so grateful for what was in my heart that I had a lovely uh, roof over my head and a comfy little bed, I whispered a prayer my first prayer I ever kind of, that ever came out of me, I whispered a prayer into the night and I said, God, I know that you are there. Use me to help the people. Use me. And I want to testify to you today that God answers prayers, sometimes not in the way that you expected and sometimes not in the time frame that you expected. But be prepared. He answers prayers. And so I grew up and I got properly introduced to religion. And they said that God's name is Allah and my religion is Islam. And that made me a Muslim. And I was proud of my identity. And I learned more about this God, his commandments, his prophets, his book and his man. And, I, and the more I learned, the more I realized how far removed I was from God. Who was I to pray that prayer? I'm but a speck of a speck, a slave for Allah. Who was I 
to ask anything of this great, big, almighty, universe-creating God. And so I was taught that I need to seek heaven by my righteous deeds, my pure and righteous deeds. And so I, I wanted to be good. I needed to be good in order for God, and he may bless me, but if I'm bad, he certainly will punish me and I could end up like those that burn in the eternal fires of hell. And so I decided as a young boy, I decided I'm going to be good. In fact, I'm actually going to be very, very good. I made up my mind. I mean, who wants to be bad anyway? It's right there in the word, right? Bad. So I was going to be very, very good. And so I grew up and guess what? Exposure to the world. I soon realized that I was oh so bad. Unclean thoughts and actions came so easily to me. And I don't know if it was worse or whether it was just a surprise, but I noticed that those that I was supposed to look up to had the same challenge. You know, these guys with their garb and their massive beards and they have this holy angry look. They were struggling with the same kinds of things. Lust, pornography, all the things that men typically struggle with. They struggle with the same things. And I thought, well, maybe the idea is that we just should try to be good. Can anyone really be good? And so I focused on the community of religion, the brotherhood of religion. And oh, how wonderful it is to be in a community, especially a Muslim community. And I learned so much in this community. <laughs> uh, I learned how to pray, how to wash myself before praying. And, you know, on a Friday we'd go as brothers in Islam, you know, uh, to, to mass prayers and uh, fasting the holy month of Ramadan and on. There's many things to learn and many things to do and many things to memorize. Later in my life, in my late 20s, my father gave me a very special present. It was a translation of the Quran into English, one of the best. And I was actually quite excited because you have to understand as a Muslim, you can read Arabic and you can even memorize and actually say and recite Arabic, but you can do it without actually understanding what you're saying. And there's a teaching that says that whenever you, you, you say these, these, you recite, the Quran, that everything around you, blessings are manifested through that. And so people focus on the recitation at a very young age. Many of my friends would be able to, you know, recite the whole Quran out of memory. And so to be able to read what is in there without having to go to the mosque was really special. So I dug into the content and unfortunately, there were issues for me. I saw contradictions, clear contradictions, which is something that you can deal with and also ethical contradictions, which is a little bit more difficult to deal with. And I think many, many Muslims around the world struggle with this. And they go and they find a resolution to the problem or some answer from an elder and that's it. There's like a red line, an invisible red line that you never ever cross. You never ever cross that or ask more of that. And you call that red line faith. <laughs> it's not faith, of course, we know that. Faith is linked to hope, but this is what people believe. When you get to a point where it's difficult to believe, you apply this thing called faith to it. And so I made sure that my faith is more than the contradictions in that book. But to be as good as God's standard, and I knew God's standard in his laws. Before I even read Matthew 5, where Jesus says, and he takes the law to its utmost, where he says, if you look at a woman with lust, you're committing adultery in your heart. If you deal with your brother in anger, you're actually committing murder in your heart. And how many people have I committed murder with? I'm just joking, All right? So I knew the standard of God and I knew I couldn't do it. And the stress and anxiety of it all, I kept hidden deep inside the secret. I may share later on in my life with a friend about 
my sin, but the anxiety I kept to myself. And inside of me, it bred something. Inside of me, it bred something, which I'll share just now. But I wanted to give you a view of how it is to live like that. How it is to actually experience life like that. Because there's two sides to this, inside me and outside, what's happening outside in the world. And so inside of me, the biggest challenge I've had in my life, living like that, knowing that I cannot attain and do what I prayed because of sin was my biggest issue. You see, I wanted to do good, be good, like that little boy that prayed that prayer. I wanted to do the works of God. But there was one problem, sin, right? Sin. And I was like that man that's so well described in Romans 7. So let's go to Romans 7 and uh, let's read. So Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I, it's a lot of scripture, but let me unpack it for you. I wanted to do good, be good. I, I, in, in my mind and in my will, I wanted to be good and free of sin. But the more I tried, the more I realized that I'm just doing the things that I don't want to do. Getting better at it. Practicing it. Justifying it. And I drank and I ate at that well of sin, hoping, hoping that I would grow bored of it. Like so many other things in my life I grew bored of. But it just grew stronger and stronger. And the law of God, which is so holy, was like a mirror, right? And you look at that mirror and you're ugly, you see ugly. You just see the ugliness. And the more you look at it, the more apparent it is that you're ugly. And inside you start feeling this hardness, this hopelessness. When you look at that mirror, it's so holy but it doesn't make you holy. It doesn't change your heart. It's just there as a tool to show you how ugly you really are. And so inside of me, it bred something. The demand of that laws the, and the frustration of not actually attaining it. I started becoming hard and demandful of other people in my life. Not initially, mind you, but as the years passed. And I got to a point where I was sharp with people, I was hard with people. I was revengeful, even violent. That's what it is to be like that inside of me. Who will deliver me from this death? And on the outside, on the outside, well, there are a lot of things happening on the outside because on the outside, I met many Christians. In South Africa, you get to meet lots and lots of Christians. They're everywhere. The problem is, well, what the telling thing is, that no one really shared with me the real gospel until I met someone. They never see, sh showed me the real gospel, the real unadulterated, real good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For me, my me the message I received all of my life is, or perhaps it was just a perspective, was that Christianity was just another way to be good. And there's a rhetoric, there's an there, there, idea, a teaching in the realm of Islam where it's like, 
hey, um, there was a revelation of God it's, that ended up being Judaism. It was corrupted. And then the, the, the gospel of Jesus came. And I don't know why they call it the gospel because it gospel is supposed to be good news. But then he came, that was corrupted. And now a newer religion called Islam came that is newer. And so for me, Islam was like a newer way to be good with God. And so when you compare that, it, it, it kind of makes sense in that small way. You see, it, for me, Christianity was like you, you want to be good to God, you do things for God, to be good on, in his good books, to be righteous, uh, to, to attain heaven, you follow the Ten Commandments, you have faith, and you, know, you be a good Christian. And to me, there was nothing for, them, for me when I, when I looked at that. When I look at that, it was, it's just, well, okay. I'm trying to be good. I'm really trying to be good. In fact, I want to do the works of God. I want God to use me. I have faith. You have no idea the kind of faith that I have. And I'm doing all of these things for God. And then you want to compare? Well, let's compare. Um, do you, um, I don't know, uh, wash yourself before you're praying? No? Okay. Do you pray with your head on the floor? No, not with your knees on the floor? Oh, you don't? Okay. Do you memorize the original Arabic words of God's book? Do you memorize the, 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 the Greek, original Greek of the New Testament? No? Okay. I'll, I treat God's book with respect, always keeping it above my waist. Do you do that? Oh, no. Okay. So maybe you should do more for God. You see, the law will allow you to compare. The law will allow you to, to compare yourself with others. And the law, if I came to a, to a church and I, I was there and the pastor was preaching about the Ten Commandments and how to be a good Christian, that's not, that, that has absolutely nothing for me because I was already trying to do that. I knew all too well that in our own will and in our own strength and in our own you know, ability to try and get to God's standard, we are lost. And so that is very telling. But God, God was not done with me. And I pray and I, 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 I praise to God that he was not done with me. He did for me what I could not do for myself. He snatched me up. He snatched me up. You see, there was a missing piece in my life, a missing piece that gave, that gives peace, and that missing piece is there by design. Did you know that God created you with eternity in your heart? I'll show you from Scripture. Uh, let's go to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3 is a beautiful piece of Scripture. Uh, it captures the notion that everything has its time. And in it, there's a verse that captures a truth about the God-given tasks that people receive. So let's read Ecclesiastes 3, 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. If you feel like it's not your time now, friend, your time is coming. Amen? He also has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. God created you with eternity in your heart. And this is why you cannot be satisfied by anything from this world. You know, things are good tools, uh, and, but they are temporal. They, they pass away, they decay, they break. And moments are good, like birthdays and so on to celebrate, but they pass. But God has created you with eternity in your heart, and so you're not created for those things. You were created for higher things, higher purposes, higher destinies. And so I thank the Lord that He placed that eternity in my heart, because that there is designed for you to seek Him out. How did I find my Messiah? How did I get to seek him out? Well, I met someone 
that could articulate that had the fruit of the peace of Jesus Christ in their life. And this is what we're to do as believers. Our job is to go out there and share it with everyone. As it says at the end of Matthew uh, 28, where it's, it's the Great Commission and we are called to make disciples of all the nations of the world. This gospel message is for everyone and the real gospel message. I met someone that could articulate that and that news, that message is such good news. It's such good news. It will change your life. You see, God made a way, a righteous way, a legal way for us to have communion with him. He didn't go soft on sin. Sin requires payment in blood and in death. And that is why the God of heavens came to this world in the person of Jesus to pay in blood and in death for the sins of the world. He didn't die on that cross. He wasn't murdered on that cross. He died on that cross because that was what he was supposed to do. There was prophecy that said how he would do it and then he did it and now it's finished. And whosoever believes that that death, that death is for you, all of your sins, past, present and future are washed away. So rejoice, that's good news. The sin issue has been dealt with. But not only that, not only that, You see, you receive something, and this is the most amazing thing, and I've seen it work in my life. You receive in yourself the Spirit of God sealed inside you. The Spirit of God sealed inside you. Wow, there's so much to say about that. We don't have the time. But I will say, this is why you will see hardened criminals receive Jesus and like that. The spirit, the spirit changes. This is why you will see jihadi Muslims bent on killing an entire nation receive Jesus and like that, they change. This is why you, you know, you didn't have to, to, to teach me how to love a Jew. You know, the conflict between Jews and Muslims. You didn't have to teach me to love a Jew, but yet months after me accepting Jesus Christ, I was on a business trip and you get to like choose, uh, you know, who you want to share a room with. I shared my room with a Jew and I loved him and I respected him. You didn't have to teach me how. You receive the spirit of God inside you. And not only that, you receive a new identity not the identity of a slave or a servant. You see that you receive the identity of a child, a child. (laughs) And you get to call God father, not only father, but Abba, which means daddy. God calls you a child and you call him daddy. And what won't your daddy do for him? What won't your daddy do for you? You know, I know the worship of a slave and a servant is a worship of feeling sorry that you're not good enough. It's the worship of feeling sorry that you, you're not working hard enough to attain righteousness. It is a worship of stress. But now I know the worship of a child. It's the worship of gratitude for how good the father is. And not only that, you receive as a child of God an inheritance, the inheritance of the righteous, the inheritance of those that are good with God, which is health, wholeness, wellness, prosperity, nothing broken, nothing missing, complete shalom. And so I wanted to 
to just say that in the beginning, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and it's such a lot to possess, but that is not the only thing that you need to possess. There's so much more, so much more maturity that you can possess. And I wanted to share a word with you on that because I've seen many Christians just stuck there. You see, when you first accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't just like that. Your life doesn't just change. Often there's a battle. For me, it was, I, I thought that I'd keep my, my uh, belief in Jesus Christ a, a secret to my family and my Muslim friends. But God had other ideas. My family came to know. They were hurt. I was hurt. They isolated me. I lost relationships that I thought was unbreakable. And so things don't just change like that. You don't just download. We're not like a cell phone where you can download a new be good app and then you're good. No, 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 no. You see, first thing is that your spirit changes. The spirit of God sealed inside you. Then if you allow it, it changes your heart. Then your heart changes. Your heart changes. Feed on the word, your heart changes. And out of what is in your heart, your actions change. You lose the bondages of sin, not even wanting it, not even being part of it. It's not of you. You are dead to sin. But it's through what is in your heart. And out of your actions, your destiny, your purposes, your callings happen. And so I wanted to uh, quickly just show you a, a, a passage, three verses that captures like the maturity of the believer. So let's go to uh, uh, 1 John 2. So here's what it starts with. The first verse is, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. So this is where it starts, right? You, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's like what it says in Isaiah 53, where it says, uh, Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Right? To you, to me, to the believer. And you make his soul an offering for your sin. And so this is a great moment. But it's not only about that. You see, I've seen believers stuck here. Stuck here. Their sins only forgiven them, but their purpose and their destiny still waiting for them. So I want to encourage you to go beyond this as a believer. You see, there's a difference between a child that goes into the father's room, opens up the cupboard, takes out the purse, opens up the purse, takes out the money, drops the purse on the floor and goes out and spends it versus the child out of respect, going to the father, knowing full well the father will do anything for them. You know what the difference is? That the spoiled little child doesn't really know what it costs for him to have those things. Doesn't really know how really, really good your daddy God is. So let's go to the second verse here, yeah. verse 13. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. You can see there, the father is still there. There's, 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 uh, the little children is still there, um, but there's a change. You've got this fathers, which are heads of household and the, the young men or single people. But the thing is, you have known him who is from the beginning, right? And you have overcome the wicked one and you have known the father. To know the father is to understand, you know, to feed yourself with the word of God. And you start seeking the scriptures and you, you fill up your heart. You let your heart change. You lose the bondage of sin. You start seeing in the Old Testament how Jesus was hidden. And in the New Testament, He gets revealed. And you start to realize He was there all the way from the beginning. And not only in the scriptures, but in your life. And you have history with Him. You have history with Him. And you get to know the Father. And you improve your actions. You know, one story that I wanted to share with you that really speaks to this is a quarrel, an ongoing quarrel, quarrel that I used to have with my wife. Sort of three years into being a believer, I used to have these constant quarrels with my wife. And, she, and it's typical. And I just want to say, honey, I love you so much. Thank you for your patience with me as I grew up in Jesus. 
So there we were, quarrels, typical quarrels, right? And her, her wife will come to me, my wife will come to me and say, hey, you need to do all of these things in the house. Why, what about this? What about that? What about that? And I'll be like, oh, really? Well, you need to do all of these things in your life. <laughs> these are the silly things, quarrels we can have. But it's always, it kind of sums up all of the issues I had with relationships. It's always that you do and then I do at transaction. When God is actually trying to change your heart, the problem is always with the other person. And I remember, you know, going through the struggle and it's only through having strong believers around me, you know, feeding constantly on the word of God that the days become weeks, become months and even years as you feed up yourself but he has made everything beautiful in its time. And I remember the time. I remember the time I was thinking about the Israelis and the Palestinians and why they always at each other's throat. And now today, here in the news, there's a lot of conflict happening as well. We must pray for them both. But there I was saying to tell it, to having this conversation with God, why does this have to happen? Why can't they just be brothers like Ishmael and Isaac? See, I have such a love for Israel and Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And I love going to Israel because it's so wonderful to see where all of these events in the Bible uh, happen. And you must visit Israel if you have a chance. I also love Muslims because that is the culture that I, God put me in. So why does this con conflict need to happen? I was asking the Lord and he showed me many things about what he's doing with Israel and that he's bringing them all back from all of this, the nations they've been scattered in. And you can read all of that in Ezekiel 36, 37. But he also showed me that when you leave your promised land and you come back, you can't expect it to lead to that it would just be there waiting for you. There can be other people there claiming your blessings as theirs. And he turns this around to me and God talks to me and he says, Son, what, who, so who will claim your blessings as theirs? Who will claim your blessings as theirs? And just like that, in a vision, I see my house, my wife, my son, all of my blessings. And I knew what the message was. And just like that, everything changed. You know, God can give you a, a, a message and you can still choose not to do it His way. I choose to do, do it His way. And just like that, I changed. I started doing things in the home and that changed everything. You know, I remember that I used to go to my wife with Ephesians 5, for example, and always show her that in Ephesians 5, you can even use scripture to justify the silly things that you want to justify. And, uh, and I, I, I used to show her that, you see, God first speaks to the woman, Hus a, a, a woman submit unto your husband before he speaks to the man, and so you should submit first. That doesn't work, men. So don't wait for your wives, husbands, to submit unto you. Go out there and just do it. He has loved us first, and so we can love first. He is the greatest leader that have ever existed, and so we can lead our homes with authority and clarity and energy and success. You know, when you love like He loves, it changes people around you. It changes the situations and the circumstances around you. So that's just one example of how inside our hearts, it can change our actions. And then let's go to the third verse. Verse 14. I've written to your fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, that I've written to you fathers. That's a change. In previously it would just say, I write to you, I write to you. Now it says, I've written to you. And there's such a precious thing to learn here. In the Greek of that sentence, that word for written, is so special, it has the notion of a verb that has no past, present, or future. It's like a verb that's in eternal state. 
There's no equivalent in English. And so it's said there, I have written to you fathers. And I really believe it's when you completely allow the Lord to flood that eternity in your heart, fully accept and, and flood that eternity in your heart. The word of God, as it says there, the word of God abides in you. You possess that word that became flesh. It abides in you. Now you overcome. Now you have victory. Now you're not only doing the works of God, you are a work of God. You know, there's a lie out there in the world that will say that you cannot transform, that you were born this way as cold as you are, whatever it is, your problems that you have, you were just born this way. You're a little monster born this way and everyone needs to accept you the way you are. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can change. You can transform. You can do the works of God. He can use you. This year that you see right now is a miracle. This should not have happened in the normal world. But you can transform. So I want to encourage you, believers, you can transform. And with that, I want to give and hand back to Pastor Joshua. Wow, what an awesome word and season. And I truly believe people's lives have been changed and people have been blessed. And I know that there are many people watching right now. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. And what I'm talking about is not whether you've been in church before or how much Bible you know. I'm asking you, do you have a living relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you ever declared Him your Lord and Saviour? Have you ever prayed the prayer of salvation? We wanna lead you in that prayer right now. God brought you today to this sermon with your salvation in mind. This is not by chance, this is by design. He so desires that you would believe on Jesus and experience His grace and be saved. Would you pray that prayer with us right now? Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross for me for dying on the cross for me. By your blood that was shed and your body that was broken, all my sin, past, present and future has been paid for in full. Today I declare, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Saviour. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, we are so excited for you. Do you know the Bible says heaven is cheering right now. Angels are cheering. God is so excited about the journey. He's just begun with you. We would love, we would love to hear from you. We would love to know that you prayed that prayer for the first time. So if you're watching inside of a social media platform like YouTube or Facebook, would you comment below and just say, I prayed that prayer for the first time. Or you can even just email the detail at the bottom of the screens or go to our website and click the link and just say, hey, I'm a new believer. I prayed that prayer for the first time. Why? Because we wanna bless you with a whole bunch of free resource telling you about Jesus. We are so excited to celebrate this decision and this moment with you. Now we're gonna receive communion together as a family, as a church. We're gonna focus our eyes on the finished work of Jesus. And wherever you are, All you need is just some bread or a cracker, something to represent the body of Jesus or some juice, grape juice, wine, water, whatever you have to represent the blood of Jesus. We don't do this for tradition. We do this because the Bible tells us that there is healing in this moment, that there is a renewal in this moment and that we should do this as often as is necessary here on earth. Well, we do it every time we gather as a church because we know how much sickness is going on in this world and how much oppression, depression and, and, and anxiety is going on in this world. And every time we get the opportunity to remind our bodies, Jesus paid for our healing and to remind ourselves that He paid for our righteousness and every sin, we do this together. If you don't have these elements, just push pause and go get it in your house or else uh, we're gonna do it together right now and you can push play when you come back. So take this bread, speak over it, say the body of Jesus broken for me, declares me healed and whole in Jesus' Name. Every sickness has been paid for at the cross. I bless this bread 
as I receive the finished work of Jesus. And we break this and now we eat and we receive. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Father. The blood of Jesus shed for us says that we are perfect, pleasing and whole. Today we receive that righteous identity. We remind ourselves who we are because of Christ. Thank You, Father, Your blood washes us clean for eternity as we receive together today. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray that today's word blessed and touched you. Let us know if you experienced something, if something happened on the inside. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to hear the testimony of how God used us to impact you. Until we see you again, stay safe, be blessed, and know that grace is greater than any obstacle you face. From us at Redemption Church, have an incredible day.